grace. 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 All right, now so for the past few weeks, we have had a Greek word kind of woven into the fabric of our teachings. Uh, the word is, and you can pronounce it several ways. I've been saying epignosis, which is really my G and my N being close together make it sound like I'm making a C, and there's no C in there. It's, it's epignosis. Um, but really, if you were a Greek person, you would pronounce it epinosi. That's how it would be pronounced in the Greek. But I'm not Greek. So um, when, when used in coming to know people, that's the word about knowledge. When it comes to do with, uh, and that word um, epinosis can be used about all kinds of things, not just people. But when it is used in context with people, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it is in the context of a relational exposure to them, coming to know them over a period of time. It's not in any way inconsistent to use an example of, like I've said, a, 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 an apprentice working underneath a master craftsman. Uh, you learn by exposure to them. You're not, and, and, and you notice that one of the big differences between the two, you know, if, you're, if you go to school, you can learn a lot about metallurgy if you're going to wind up being someone that is a goldsmith or a coppersmith or whatever, okay? Uh, which those trades are much less pronounced now than they used to be because now so many things are done mechanically in, in machine shops and so on. But uh, when people used to do this on the on their own, you, you could still go to college and you can learn, I mean, just tremendous volumes about of information of what alloys uh, to, to work, you know, what, what metals combinations make what alloys and all that and what makes it strong, what makes it weak, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and so you walk away with a lot of book knowledge, but practically no practical knowledge of how to actually do it. You go, to, you go and work in an apprentice shop underneath a person, you don't only learn the things you would have learned in the book knowledge, but you also learn some things that you would not. Like uh, you might be working with a, 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 a I'm, of course I'm talking about my pay grade when I talk about metallurgy, but uh, I know a little bit about it. But see, you're working with someone that uh, does steel. And uh, especially back in the day before there was a lot of that mass produced by machines. And, uh, and this, they might say, well, you know, you want to add nickel to this uh, for this reason. You want to add this to it for that reason. But, you know, if you get the nickel from over here in, say, whatever, some province, it, you want to use a little bit less percentage of it because it's also got a little bit of this in it. Whereas if you get it from over here in this province, then you, can, you need to increase it by 2%. I know the formula says in the textbook it says... 5%, but I'm telling you, it doesn't really work straight 5% because other things are in the middle of that metal based on where you get it from. You see what I'm saying? You, things you would pick up from a guy who's worked with it for years that you're not going to pick up in a textbook. And and not only that, but you, you learn how they do it. You watch their method. You learn from them so that when you get done, you find yourself doing the same actions they did. And, 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 and being able to produce the same quality that they produced. I mean, you see what I'm saying? So it, the word uh, epignosis embraces that kind of knowing, a relational knowing that comes through influence and rubbing shoulders with a person. It's a relational knowledge. Going one step further, when we're dealing with, like we are here in Colossians, and as we often are in the New Testament, the, the word epignosis is often used in our relationship with Jesus. And so it's not just the staunch kind of relationship that an apprentice would have with a master craftsman, but let's go one step further and say it'd be kind of like a son learning in learning a trade, the family trade from his father. So you've still got the master craftsman and the apprentice, but you've got an additional layer of relationship on top of that. You see what I'm saying? That right there is a great illustration of what the word epignosis means in relation to Jesus. We are underneath him, but we're underneath him like a child is with a father, but we're learning a family trade. And so there's a skill involved, and we're learning this from him by experience, by doing. Amen? And, you know, and part of the learning process, we know this. We, I would know this. I would know this is true spiritually by the very fact that I know that it's true in the natural. Because God made the natural world to mirror the spiritual reality of a, of a human being's life. One of the best ways for a person to learn is by making mistakes. One of the best ways. 
You can sit there and you can overtrain a person to the point where you have mentally crammed enough information in their head so that if they did everything you said, they would avoid all mistakes, but they really, at that point, they don't know why those things are true because they've never made the mistake. You know what I mean? They, they just know, don't do this. But if you just told them enough that they could put their hand to the task and make a mistake in the process, then now they are going to not only learn what you would have told them, but now they understand why it's true. And they won't make that mistake again. Are you following? And this is the way it works relational with God. I mean, God grows us step by step, baby step by baby step, knowing we are going to make mistakes, knowing that we're going to sin, knowing that we're going to do things that are inconsistent with his character, and he's not sweating it. He already saw that coming. He knows that. And that's not to say he takes sin lightly. He does not. Clearly, he paid Jesus' life for that. But at the same time, he's not going to... He, he, the way that God works with people, and I think this is one of the reasons why God made time, is we have a way of marking it, and I think the marking of it is telling us something different than we think it is. I think that the marking of time is there to show us the heart of God towards us, because in our learning, it takes so much time to get from point A just to point B. I'm not talking about A to Z. We're not even looking. The C is not even on our radar. We're just trying to struggle to get to B. You know what I mean? And in our walk with Christ sometimes. And and the amount of mercy, the amount of long suffering, the amount of 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 time the Spirit of God is willing to invest in our education and our growing and our maturity shows He's not in a hurry to get you from A to B. This is not just about end game. It's about the journey, right? It's about what is developed inside the human heart and what is learned by, if you will, osmosis through influence on the way there. That is as important as the goal. It is not, it's not more important than the goal, but it's as important. Because if it weren't, he'd just warp us to be. Right? I mean, it's not like that'd be beyond his ability. You see what I'm saying? This little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit with all the mess ups and all the messiness in between that we often walk in condemnation over. And, and, and don't get me wrong, our hearts should sometimes condemn us. Our hearts should sometimes, uh, you know, um, uh, cause us to recognize the treason of, of some of our actions. There's no question about that. Remorse, l lament and, and mourning and weeping uh, before God is sometimes 100% necessary. But even that is part of the process. Because it doesn't show relationship if there's no remorse, does it? Yes or no? It doesn't. There's no real connection if I don't sense remorse for what I've done. But from God's perspective, this isn't about trying to make you feel bad. But at the same time, the fact that you feel bad has a healing effect in it. Right in the middle of it, baked into the pie. Because the fact that it hurts that I hurt him makes me less ready to do that same thing again. I don't want to go through this again. I don't want to wound him again. I don't want to to scar the heart of God because I'm just being such a pot. You know what I mean? And there's part of that's a healthy thing. The, the Bible talks about having a healthy distrust of yourself. And it's not actually in the actual words of your reading in the English, but it's hidden in the Greek. It actually says to have a healthy distrust of yourself. And, uh, uh, and, you know, I think everybody's been walking with God long enough. You've already got that under your belt pretty well. <laughs> we already don't trust ourselves because we already know what we're going to do. And it's often not going to always be the best thing. So this, this knowledge that we're talking about is interwoven with what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks in Colossians. And you can go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Last week, as we were walking through Colossians chapter 3, I asked you to look for three things. The first one was how the resurrection shows up and how our hope of that full resurrection inspires us towards living a pure life, right? Okay, and you'll see that show, show up. Number two was, I want you to pay attention to God's passion for us. God's passion for us. Because our passion for God means nothing unless he first loved us, right? That's what enabled us to love him was... Uh, we love him because he first loved us. Everything we do is an echoed response to God. because And, and we will get into this next week, but uh, it, literally, there's a reason why, and I keep on stressing this, and you'll probably get it more and more, and I'm sorry and on one level, and I'm not sorry in another. 
I'm sorry that you have to be exposed to it so much, and I'm not sorry because uh, the truth is you need to be exposed to it a lot. And that is that God is the male in the relationship. We are the female. He takes the lead, which is another reason why our culture is running the way it is. Amen? Are you following? Mm -hmm. And I understand. You probably get tired of hearing it. I get tired of saying it. But the point is, the culture is pushing it so much. If, any, if we ought to get tired of anything, it ought to be of the world pushing that down our throat. You know what I mean? So if you, you just if you hear me say it almost every time you see me, I'm sorry, but I'm getting one shot at you and they get the rest of the week. You know what I mean? So I mean, and, and it's just, they just pour it out constantly. It's all over the place. God is the initiator. He's the aggressor. He's the pursuer. I don't love him first. My love is an echoed response to his pursuit of me. Amen? And that's the way it ought to be, by design. All right. And the last thing, of course, is our response to that passion. So now, so we ended with three major thoughts. So those are the three things I want us to look for. We ended with three major thoughts and we only covered seven verses last week. The three thoughts were God's wrath that's brought up in the passage that we learned a little bit about it last week, didn't we? God's wrath is not personal. Meaning, in other words, God is not reacting because you hurt him as a person. God is not reacting at all. Because if God were going to react, there would have been no salvation. Are you following? If God was a reactor, he would have reacted at the fall and there would have been nothing but a grease spot left. And you and I would have never even come into existence. God's not a reactor. He chooses to take action. Amen? Now, and we can thank God for that. Uh, but not only that, when he acts in wrath towards man. It is not over an indignancy that he has sustained personally. He is acting against what you have done to the Son and to the Spirit. Are you saying the Father God? He is responding to the way that we have treated his Son in a dismissive way. The way we have turned a deaf ear and a blind eye to the work of the Holy Spirit who is following around every human on this planet, practically begging them, please listen to what I'm telling you. Jesus is your life. He is your salvation. Surrender that, that you know, I got this mental picture this morning as I was thinking through these things of how the, the world gets so offended at the church and, uh, and, 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 and the things that we share and the things that we teach and the way that we think. And the reason why, in one level, if you could strip away the flesh, because you don't want to argue with the world. You don't want to argue with the world. Because i got to tell you, they're better arguers than you are. They are. They're better at it. And there's a reason why they're better at it. They've got more invested in trying to be right. If you could strip away the flesh, because the flesh, they, they come across pious and, 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 and stoic and, and, and right and, and, and all this you know, stuff that they try to portray. And they're very good at their little makeup and their little mask they wear and that they portray to the world. But if you just strip away the flesh, you could see what's really going on beside, in, in the spirit world, you, if you want to say it that way. In, in reality, they literally in the middle of, of a storm-tossed ocean holding on to a log that is waterlogged and sinking. And they are grasping for everything they can to keep their head above water. And you represent the thing that's going to yank the, yaw, the log away. And they are grasping for everything they've got. They don't realize that what you're trying to offer them is the safety of the deck of a luxury ocean liner. They don't realize that. All they see is the log. And you represent someone that's going to take it from them. You know what I'm saying? And they are grasping for the only thing they've got, you know? Uh, how many of you, have any of you ever argued with a person that has a mental disease, like dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that? Mm -hmm. You can't win. Mm -hmm. There is no winning. And the reason why is they are committed to this. And, and you eventually realize, I'm really not committed to this. <laughs> I just want it to be over. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay? This is uh, the church with the world. They literally have a mental disease. And they're committed to their position because to them it represents the only life they got. And they will fight you tooth and nail for it. Are you following me? And so you, know, you don't want to get into an argument with the world. But God's wrath against the world is because of their blatant disregard 
to the Spirit of God and our advances as children of God speaking into the world and, and not trying to yank away the water, the, the waterlogged piece of wood they're holding onto in the middle of the ocean, but replace it with something of great safety and security. But they don't see that. And so they fight and they, they shove back and they're, they're unwilling to lift their gaze and look. And even when they do, they do it with severe distrust. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And God says, you know what? Uh, you know, that's the reason why he continues to go after them and continues to show mercy and shows long suffering. But, you know, the longer he does that, the more they harden and harden and harden and harden their heart. And eventually they're spitting and retaliating at the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of his son. God eventually says, you know what? I'm done. My, my son and the Spirit of God has taken enough of your spitting at them, and I will not tolerate it anymore. Because to continue to tolerate it from you would be to be honoring you more than I honor them, and I refuse to do that. That's what his wrath comes from. Okay, are you saying? Because, and remember, the word wrath means longing with grief. He longs for that person in the ocean. He longs for that lost person. But the continued, sustained shoving back of the Spirit of God, that disdain towards Jesus, that hatred towards anything but holding on to their own ability, God gets to the point where he's like, you know what? That has caused enough grief, and I'm done. Are oh, you seeing what I'm saying? Terry, you had something a minute ago. Um, just another nuance of the mental disorder relational to what the world sees, and that is that... Yeah. Um, because they're in darkness, they're in many cases, they really can't see. No, they, they yeah. really don't understand. They no, they really don't. They have no connection to what mm -hmm. you're trying to explain them. Yeah. Well, it, it, and it depends. That's true and not true. It's true on one level if it's progressed. But the convicting work of the Holy Spirit sheds light. Right. Or there's nothing to reject. You can't reject something you can't see. It's not that they didn't see it. It's that, that when they did see it, they're more familiar with and they like their darkness more than the light and they cling to it as a matter of choice. And every time they do that, the darkness gets darker and the light gets harder to see. Okay? But so I, 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 the reason why I'm not in any way being dismissive of your illustration because you're right. But I also want, but if, if it's just taken like that, it makes it sound like they have no choice. And they do have a choice because they actually do see light. Okay, remember it says that, it talks about Jesus, he says, who gives light to every man who comes into this world. He gives light to everyone. Everyone, right? Now, I mean, we progressively can make that light dimmer and dimmer and dimmer by rejecting it, rejecting it, rejecting it, but that doesn't mean you did not see it. Amen? Okay, so that's, but that's a good point. The next thing was that, you know, um, the sins that were addressed in the first part of this chapter we read so far are sins of passion. So God's passionate response is due to us taking our passions that should belong to him and place them on earthly things. All of those sins at first list were sins of passion. We went through that last week. Every one of them were sins of passion, misplaced passion. Passions that belong to God as our creator, and we have chosen to love, adore, and put our passions towards other things on a horizontal plane rather than on a vertical plane. And that is what stirs the wrath of God, the longing with grief, okay? And the third thing is that we talked about was our life, that Jesus is our life. It's hidden in Christ, in God. Our union with God is hidden. It's not something that you just trip over. If you're not looking for, if you are not seeking for union with God, even as a child of God, you will largely go without it. Not because of the fact that you, and of course, if you are a child, you are literally united with God, but you're not enjoying the fruit of it. Because you, you, could, you can literally, uh, one of the great examples of that has been the Emancipation Proclamation. When it first took place, there were very few takers. It took people of courage, like that one black woman I never remember the name of, who refused to sit in the back of the bus. Praise God for that woman. Amen. It took tenacity. It took strength of character to say, no. The law says I've got a right to sit anywhere on this bus I want to sit, <laughs> you know? And she forced the agenda because she knew what her rights were, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, most people walked around as though there had been no proclamation because they were afraid to assume it, and so they didn't live in the reality of it. It was still the truth, but it was truth that has to be fought for. 
Are you seeing what I'm saying? Same thing with our union with God. It is a reality. But it's a reality you have to fight for. By which I mean, you have to fight against all those other passions that you're deciding to be unified with aside from God. Because you cannot serve the world and God at the same time. Either you're going to be united with the world or you're going to be united with God. You're going to make a choice. And there's going to have to be a struggle involved. There has to be a choice. And the Bible calls that suffering. So before we rush into this new territory that we're about to head into, let's read passingly real quickly over these verses again, and then we'll start back starting in chapter verse 8. It says, starting in verse 1, it says, If, however, you have risen with Christ, seek. That word seek means to exert effort and energy in the pursuit of something. Seek with energy and effort. Seek the things that are above where Christ is enthroned at God's right hand. Give your minds over to these things that are above and not to the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden. Your union with God is hidden with Christ and God. Your epignosis between you and God, your ability to know and be changed through your union with God is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ appears fully at this full redemption, at his full, at his full revelation, when he appears at the rapture, is really what he's talking about, he is our true life, then you also will appear with him in glory. Everything that could be known about Christ will be known about him. Everything that could be known about you in your redeemed status will be known about you. You will be recognized to be fully his. Your character will be completely like him. And it will be exposed. God, Jesus, you and I all revealed in glory. Verse 5. Therefore, knowing those things, keeping your mind on that's where you're headed, put to, uh, to death your earthward inclinations, fornication, impurity, sensual passion, unholy desire, and greed, which is a form of idolatry. It is on an account of these very sins that God's wrath is coming. God's reaction to passion is because of your misplaced passion. Right? He says, And you also were once addicted to those things while you were living under their power. Now, this is a whole and complete thought, verses 1 through 7. It started off with, If this is true about you in Christ, then abide in him and live as a result. And, 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 and then he talks about, because at one point you were in the world and you abided there and you lived in their ways. But now that you have recognized that you are in Christ, if, abide, live. It's all the way through the passage. If, abide, live. If, abide, live. If, abide, live. It's all through the passage. It's a complete circle, a complete thought. Give your attention fully to that which you said you were committed to. Choose to make that decision. I'm going to give my attention. I'm going to pour effort into seeking the thing that I said I was committed to when I bowed the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those sins of passion for which other things than God are, that's the focus of God's wrath against the world. His anger is against that. Jesus addressed the same possibility, though, in the church when he addressed that, when he talked about the parable of the sower and the seed. The kind of heart of a child of God that chooses to pursue passions of the world rather than the passion that belongs to God is found in the third heart that does receive the word of God, but it also receives the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of, of wealth, and the desires for other things than God. Right? Have what effect? It chokes out the word of God so that it has no effect in you. Right? What have you done? You put a chokehold on the Spirit of God. You put your, your hands around his neck and are squeezing it, saying, I don't want to hear about Christ. When we do that, you see why that would cause a little bit of anger. Yes? Okay? Now, going on down to verse 8, it says, But now that we are Jesus's, right? Along with those sins we just talked about, those sins of passion, which we used to substitute for finding our pleasure and our fulfillment in God, we must also now set these aside. So I want you to notice there's a divide here. He's saying once you came to Christ, he considers that you're already committed to the first list. He sees that as a done deal. You and I realize that not always. But he says, he already sees this. This is what you used to be committed to. Sins of passion against God. But now that you've already laid those things aside, now in addition to that, this is another list you need to deal with. 
So he divides the sins into two groups. Are you seeing that? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. But now you must rid yourself of every kind of sin, angry and passionate outbreaks, ill will, evil speaking, foul mouthed abuse, so that these may never soil your lips again. Do not speak falsehoods to one another, for you have stripped off the old self with its doings. Have. You have. Past tense. And have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being remolded into full knowledge so as to become like him who created it. Now I want you to notice that the first list had to do with outward passions and allegiances to things other than God. The second list has to do with how we behave towards those that God loves and by loving them and seeking to live in peace with them ourselves. The first list had to do with outward passions that we substituted for God. But now that you have placed God on the throne where he belongs and he is the object of your passion, now you're going to have to start loving the things he loves. The people he loves, which is what that whole second list is about. He couldn't address the second list until you're committed to the first one. Until you're committed to passionately pursuing and loving him, he could never expect you to be passionate and pursuing the things that he loves, right? But if you really do love him, you will embrace as your own his loves. We've talked about this in here before in regard to relationships and marriage. One of the biggest problems that there is in marriage, and there's a lot of them, but one of them is our dogged determination to have our own stinking way instead of losing ourselves in the other person. When we commit ourselves saying, I love you, what you are really, you may not realize what you're saying, but what you're saying is, I have lost everything that I was before. Every passion, every desire, every pursuit, every dream is now dead and buried. It doesn't exist anymore. This is a new beginning and a new life in which I place you and your desires above me and my desires. If you want it, now I want it. It has to own your will. If it doesn't own your will, you're really not married. You're just make-believe. This is just dress up. This is, this is playing. It's not real. I never look at this, but that is so perfect this morning. Terry just gave me something that she found this morning that I guess of course it coincides with this. So I'm going to read it. It says, I can honestly say that I became a better wife and a better Christian when I became a better helper. Realizing that I am, um, I am on assignment from God to help my husband, um, my husband opened my eyes. According to God's plan, I was not to, I was not to compete with my husband. Instead, I am to be solidly behind him supportive of him. He is the one who is supposed to win, and I'm supposed to help make his victory possible. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And that is very true of marriage, especially with the wife towards the husband, as far as the direction of their life, because he should be the captain, therefore he's the one setting the destination. But it's also true of the captain towards, or the husband towards the wife right? He serves her as Christ served the church, right? When he came to the world, he said, I'm among you, even though I am your Lord. He was very clear about that, right? Nevertheless, I'm still among you as someone who serves, right? I am Lord, but I act like a servant. That's the way it works. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And and so, uh, very good illustration. Thank you, Terry. So, Yes, obviously. Yeah, you're right. Applying that whole thing to God where we get lost in him. Our commitment was, I am. I used to have these passions I pursued and I used these things as substitutes. I had this vacuum, God-shaped vacuum in my heart that I was trying to fill with things other than you. And I pursued other passions that would give me temporary relief from that longing and that emptiness. But now that I've come to you, I am devoid and divesting myself from these other passions, these other lovers, and I'm committed to you alone. And that is right there. That's the commitment of a marriage vow. I'm committed to you. Ring on finger. What does that mean? For better, for worse, for life, for death, period. I'm committed to you, right? 
And now your passions are my passions. Literally, that's what these two lists are about. First one was the commitment to him. Devoid of other passions, you are now my passion. The second list is, now because you are my passion, I'm going to be committed to pursuing and loving what you love. And that's going to produce actions in me that are consistent with that decision. Are you following? What is that list again? Let's read it again. And recognize what the, the object of these things we know from history, just from reading the New Testament, are our brothers and sisters in Christ. But now, now that you've already got your passions right, you're towards God, now you must rid yourself of every kind of sin. Angry and passionate outbreaks. Against who? Well, really anyone, but particularly your brother and your sister in Christ. Right? Angry and passionate outbreaks. Ill will. You ever had an ill will against a brother or sister in Christ? Evil speaking, foul mouth abuse, so that these may never soil your lips again. Do not speak falsehoods to one another. See, right in that very verse, we understand who we're talking about. He says, one another. Who's he writing to? A church. Believers. So one another means my brother and my sister in Christ. Does it mean you're, you're free to lie to the world? No, of course not. But God's more focused about his family than he is those outside of the family. Your behavior needs to, you need to remember what is the one thing we've seen over and over and over again. And even the world agrees with this on some level when it, when it meets their agenda. Um, you know, you ever wonder why the world is all about saying that, you know, it's none of your business what I do. You know, what I do in my private life is my private business until someone's in politics. Now all of a sudden what they do in their private life is everybody's business and we can all judge them based on what they do in their private life. But if you do that to me, oh, I'm going to get all kinds of mad about that. And I'm going to get, oh, no, you don't have a right to do that. That's my private life. I can do whatever I want to do. Well, what about their right to just do whatever they want to do in their own private life? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the reason why it bothers us with them is because the truth of the matter is you, realize, you really realize that you can't divorce what they're doing in their private life from what they're doing in their professional life. If they're this way at home, they're going to be this way in the professional life, which is why it's also relevant with you in your life. Yes, what you do in your private life is everybody's business because it makes a difference as to how you're going to interact with everyone else. How you conduct your business life, how you conduct your friendships are going to be exactly the way that you conduct your home life. There is no difference. Now, I understand when you're outside, you might put a, a friendly face on, but your agenda is the same. You're the same person. It's not like you're two different people. You're the same person. It is relevant. Of course it's relevant. In every way it's relevant. And so he's saying here, in the body of Christ, let's deal with what we do in the home. Because if, I, if God can get your behavior at home, he'll have your behavior outside of the body of Christ. If I can get you to just treat your brother and your sister like you ought to treat them, I will know and can rest assured that when you go out into the world, you'll treat them the way you ought to treat them. But if I can't trust you here, you know what I mean? So these are the things he's saying. I don't want, he says, you got to rid every kind of sin of angry, passionate outbreak against your brother, ill will towards them, evil speaking, foul mouth abuse. Boy, we do abuse one another, don't we? Don't, do not speak falsehoods towards one another because you have stripped off the old man with his doings and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being remodeled into the full knowledge so as to become like the one who created him. So you become like Jesus, right? So, the first list had to do with all those outward passions. The new one has to do with uh, loving those whom God loves, right? Now, this word remolded is also translated in some Bibles as renewed. It literally means just that, to make qualitatively new. What does qualitatively mean? It means quality. The quality of it is new. Have you ever, uh, some of you may have done this, have restored old um, antique furniture? If it's now, now there's some that you can't restore. I mean, if they've been waterlogged and stuff like that, they've been destroyed. But if if it's just been time and and, and stuff like that that, that have uh, deteriorated it, maybe kids, you know, did crowns on it and stuff like that. Maybe there was a stain on it or something, and you might have to sand it down and you have to do a lot of work with it to restore it. But the wood itself, there's nothing wrong with the wood. It's good wood. Are you following me? In fact, the fact that it's aged might make it better, more valuable than new wood because it's hardened and the tannins have come to the surface. There's more character to it, right? So working with that wood, renewing it is not... It, renewing a, 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 an old object that has got to, um, value to it doesn't make it less valuable. It's more valuable. 
That's exactly what happened with you. God didn't have to get rid of you and make another one. What he made in the first place was a good one. It's just that sin and, and, and defiance against God had corrupted it. And so he renewed the quality of what had been there. Are you seeing what I'm saying? You're still you. I mean, you don't doubt that. When you got born again, you do realize that was the same you that came out of the born again that went into the born again, right? <laughs> because some of those some old, same old habits were still around. God was still buffing the table, right? But, you know, he says it's renewed in quality. That's what it means. When he talks about the old and the new self or the old and the new man, the word self or man is a word which, when used in this place, focuses upon the nature and the character of a person. Like I've been telling you all this while, these are character issues. It means the, the, the disposition or the attitude which is created and cherished by the new nature. That's what it means. I'll say that again. It means the disposition or the attitude which is created and cherished in the new nature. That new one that you've been given. Okay? Created and cherished. In that new nature. Now, verse 11. In that new creation that we just talked about, the new buff polished table. It's really not a new one. It's the same table, but it's been changed in quality, hasn't it? We're no longer darkness. We are now light, but we are still we. Mark is still Mark. It's just that Mark used to be dead and in darkness, and now I'm alive and in light, but I'm still Mark. Right? Okay? So he says, that new creation, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free man, but Christ is everything and is in all of us. Again, all of us talking about those that are born again. Now, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself here, but it's on purpose. This phrase that I just read, that whole verse 11, in this new creation, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is everything and is in all of us. That phrase right there, there's another phrase very much like it found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, almost exactly the same. But these two verses have been taken out of context to say something it does not say, and that is kind of what we do as Christians. We, we, we will take something out of its context in order to bolster an ideology that we support. I believe this, and this verse sounds like it supports what I'm saying, so forget about the context, forget about where Paul was going with this statement. I'm going to cherry pick it and use it to support this ideology of mine. Are you following what I'm saying? It's only half a sentence anyway. What's that? It's only half a sentence. Yeah, you're right. There's a comma in the beginning. You're right. Absolutely. You're right. There is. Absolutely. It's, connect, it's connected on both sides, isn't it? There's a greater context to this. This is talking about me as me and my new life as a Christian, right? And my union with God. Okay? That's what it's talking about. This isn't talking about specifically um, uh, uh, whether or not I was born a Jew or whether I was born a Greek or whether I was born a slave or, or a free person, whether I'm a business owner or whether I'm a, um, an employee or any of those things, those natural external things do not speak to this at all, right? Every one of us, there's no one person that's got a leg up on the other in coming to Christ and being a new creature, right? The, the slave doesn't have any disadvantage below the owner, as far as coming to Christ, they can both come to Christ on equal footing, can't they? Doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. Are there advantages to being a Jew? Yeah, Paul pointed them out. He talked about. It. He said, he said, what advantage is there to being a Jew? He said, much in every way. He said, because to us we're given the writings and the oracles of God. It wasn't given to you guys, it was given to us. Of course there's an advantage, right? But it, when it comes to coming to Christ, did they have a better advantage to coming to Christ than the Gentile did? No. We both come on equal footing, don't we? It's just, in fact, in some respects, it was easier to the Gentile to come to Christ than it was to the Jew because they misinterpreted those very same passages and so they didn't recognize Jesus when he came, right? But there was an advantage. That also, a Jew. Being a Jew, uh, as, far as, um, as far as us being in Christ, we're all one. But Paul also said in the book of Romans, both of those two references are in the book of Romans, he said, uh, he said you know, <clears throat> As Gentiles, you are our debtors. You owe us. 
If it weren't for us, there would have been no Messiah. Paul said that. You owe us. And he said, he said that in the context of when he was traveling among the Gentile churches, collecting money to give to the Jewish church in Jerusalem because they were under opposition. And he said, you ought to give this because you're their debtors as Gentiles. So I want you to see what I'm saying here. In this passage, he's not saying Jew and Gentile doesn't exist. He's, and that there aren't implications about being a Jew and being a Gentile. He's just saying that there's no advantage of one over the other in the new life. Both can become like Jesus with as great difficulty or as great ease as the other. There is no distinction. Are you seeing what he's saying? Okay. This has been used regarding genders, which the chapter goes in to talk about, which is why I'm bringing it up now. We're not talking about it today. We're not going to get that far. We don't have time. But... Um, uh, he talks about the role of a husband and the role of a wife and the role of a child and the role of a slave. And the roles are different. They're not the same. And if you take this verse to mean that we're all on an equal playing field and so therefore there are no distinctions, then you're misunderstanding what he's saying. Because in the same passage, he shows, yes, there is a difference. Are you following what I'm saying? He's not contradicting himself. It's not like a couple of verses later, he got amnesia and forgot that he said this. It's just that when he said it, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about coming to Christ and taking on the nature of Christ. A guy doesn't have an advantage over a girl. A girl doesn't have an advantage over a guy. A child doesn't have a disadvantage over a parent. Everybody can come into the nature of the likeness of Christ. Everybody, right? That's the context. So it's very important that we hold on to that when we go forward because otherwise we, we wind up <laughs> misinterpreting what Scripture says. Uh, so, um, uh, let's see. As we go forward, the question that we have to ask is, we do have freedoms once we've come to Christ. Paul is re referring here to uh, one... He's referring to our freedom that we have in our relationship with Christ, but this freedom has to be temper, tempered with the character of love and loving servitude as Jesus came to serve and not be served, right? I mean, as I quoted earlier, I'm among you. I, your Lord, am among you as one who serves. But in the, in the sentence, he started the sentence with the recognition, I'm here, you're here, but I'm among you as one who serves you. But that doesn't change. What I'm doing doesn't change who I am. I'm still your Lord. <coughs> Are you seeing? Yeah, this is a concept the world has a hard time wrapping their head around. <coughs> like, well, you know what? That, that doesn't make any sense. You know, the guy that is the leader should always be the one being served. And Jesus pointed out that distinction to his disciples. He says, he says you know, you guys, because they were asking, you know, they're pressing him, who's going to be able to sit at your right hand and your left hand and who's going to be the most important in your kingdom when it comes and all that. He says, you know, it's not my authority to give that to anybody. But, you know, really, the real core issue here, guys, is the desire behind that question. Why are you wanting to be better than your brother? Why are you wanting a better position? Why are you wanting to sit closer to the throne of power than your brother? You ought to be deferring to your brother and say, if you both were coming to that throne together, you ought to say, you know, if there's a fight, there should be a fight of who's going to give that position to the other, not who's going to get there first. You see what I'm saying? You guys' heart's wrong. He said, he said, as you guys take on the authority in the kingdom, he said, you know, in the world... The people that are the taskmasters act like they're God and they make everybody serve them. He said, but I'm telling you, in the body of Christ, it doesn't work that way. He made it real clear. He said, whoever's going to be um, you know, a master must be servant of everyone, right? That's the way things are done in the kingdom. That's why the world doesn't get it because the world doesn't act that way. Jesus himself said it. The world thinks this way. You guys need to think this way. We don't think like the world thinks. If anybody has ever served anybody, it's God has served us. Hasn't he? Over and over and over again. In fact, every day. Jesus ever lives to speak Mark's name before the Father. He lives for that. That's crazy. 
This is my God. This is the one I was talking with, the, with uh, Vivian uh, before church this morning. We're talking about, you know, just looking at the world and just, and all that, I mean, just like in the backyard, uh, you know, there, there's so many different varieties of plants. I couldn't even tell you what they all are. And they all are different. And, 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 and they're, they're just, they're not only different names, but different characters, different things. You can do different things with them. And, and every one of them were in the mind of our creator and he made them all in one day. And I'm like, I can't embrace in my head a mentality of brilliance like that. The brilliance is just beyond imagination. It's bar, beyond the ability to wrap your head around, you know? That's my creator. And that same one that created all these things to honor the father and to create a world in which he can be known by the people he made in his image, that same God is Jesus incarnate and he lives to speak my name before the Father every day. I am so humbled it's unbelievable. Think about that. I mean, we ought to be honored that he even knows our name, much less says it ever. But he doesn't just say it ever, he says it every day. Before the Father. He, he, in the same way that I confess Jesus, he confesses me before the Father. He's ours. That one belongs to me. Right? Thank you, God. He speaks my name. I'm owned by him. Amen? And, and so this, pre, this, this privilege we have, you know, in Christ, it has to be tempered by loving servitude, even as Jesus served. So I have to ask myself, where is my line in the sand? Remember the songs we sang this morning? They're all about submission to Christ. They're all about surrender to Christ. But we need to ask ourselves, where is it that God could ask me to go that I would say, I'll go to this point, but no further? We all have a line. That line progressively keeps on changing as we grow closer to God. We're willing to concede more and give more. And, and we recognize that when we weren't willing to give it, we now see it as selfishness, right? Whereas five years ago, we wouldn't have. So that line keeps on moving. But the question is, where is it now? Because the line really technically shouldn't exist at all for any of us. There should be nothing he could ask that, that we are not in the middle of doing before he finishes the sentence. Right? Amen? But there is a line. Am I willing to give all that he's requiring? Am I willing to live as God tells me to live? Am I willing to submit to his ways rather than force expressions of selfish independence from him? Where is my line in the sand? Paul says, clothe yourself. These are the things you set aside. Now, these are the things that you put on. Because he's talking about put off the old stuff. Put on the new stuff, right? This is what you stop doing. And you stop doing them to your brother. But this is what you start doing, and you start doing them to your brother and sister in Christ. He says, clothe yourself as God's own people, holy and dearly loved, with tender mercies, kindness, lowliness of mind, lo meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, ready to forgive one another. If, there is, if one has a grievance against another, just as... The Lord has forgiven you, even so you must do. He's not saying it's a choice. He says you have to. If you want to believe belong to me, you've got to forgive them, period. And you forgive them to the same degree and the same extent that I forgave you. Or it's really not forgiven. You wop it away and you throw it in the sea of forgiveness and you do not call it to memory again. I didn't say you're not going to remember it. I'm not going to say things don't come up and it might pop back in your head, but you shove it back in the ocean again. You're not calling it to mind. You're not holding it against them. You've released them, right? He says, and over all of these things I just mentioned, he said, put on love, which is the perfect bond of union. God's saying, if you want to be unified with me, you're going to have to be unified with those I'm unified with. You cannot say you love me and don't love my children. Right? He says, and then let the peace which Christ gives settle all questionings in your heart to which peace indeed you were called as belonging to his one body and be thankful. Right? Right? Now, there's lots here 
but only a few words really need to be explained. Most of them are pretty obvious, okay? So we're not going to bother with them. We understand the idea of being tender-hearted. That doesn't really need definition. We understand being kindness. What is lowliness of mind, though? Well, it means to see ourselves as we really are. In particular, it is to see what Paul said above, that none of us has an advantage above the other, whether you're Jew or Greek or whatever. Live that way. Live aware of it, right? Jews are not better than Gentiles. Men are not better than women. Women are not better than men. Parents are not better than children. Owners are not better than slaves. There is no, uh, in those, uh, those in political power are not better than those that are under them. As such, realize that when we serve, we are not stooping at all. When I serve my brother and my sister in Christ, it's not like I'm in some lofty position and I have to stoop so low to serve you. If I see it that way, I'm not seeing clearly because we're on a level playing field. I don't have to stoop far to tie your shoes, right? I don't have to stoop low to wash your feet. It's not like I'm really having to go real far, you know what I mean? Because we're on the same level playing field. Think that way. Have that kind of a mindset. As such, realize that when we serve, we're not stooping far at all. In fact, we are seeing ourselves as the created. Paul's letter to the Philippians, by the way, helps us with this exact same word. Now, you can just make a reference to it in your notes, or you can turn there. It's up to you. It's up to you. I don't care. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. He uses this exact same word, but in Philippians, he gives us an illustration of what it means. Okay? So Philippians 2, 3 through 5, this lowliness of heart is illustrated. It says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also include with that the interests of others. Make your own attitude that which Jesus had. That's what lowliness of mind means. It doesn't mean ignore your interests. It means include with your interests as equally as important the interests of others. But then on when it comes to do with trying to make those interests a reality, I treat others as more important than myself. They aren't. He didn't say realize they are more important. He said treat them as though they were more important. Hello? They're not more important. They're as just as important as you are. No more, no less, but you treat them like they're more important. Can you see how if the entire body of Christ lived that way, you would never have a need? Because you are doing everything you can. You're bending your effort to spend yourself on the needs of other people, but you've got an ocean of people doing the same thing to you. Everybody's needs gets met and, and we're saved from selfishness. It's the complete opposite of the world. Every man for himself. If you don't get it, it's because you didn't work for it. This way, we're working for everyone else and we're benefiting from everyone else. Are you seeing what I'm saying? But we don't use that as the reason why we do it. Because you already know your brother and your sister is not always going to be on board with it. So you're committed to live for their benefit, whether they ever live for your benefit or not. Because this isn't about what you get. It's about honoring the one that you belong to. He said, you honor me by loving what I love. You don't worry about whether they're loving you. That's not your problem. Oh, it feels like it's my, my, my problem. I know I feel that way, but it's not your problem. They don't belong to you. They belong to me. You serve me by serving them. That's your only attention. How do I know that? How do I know I'm getting this right? Because in other places of the Bible, it tells us whenever we're like if we're, we're a husband serves a wife, a wife serves a husband, or when a servant serves a master, it says, don't do it as men pleasers. I mean, in other words, make sure you're busy when they're looking at you. And then when they walk around the corner, go back to what you're really doing. No, no, no. He said, stay working on that level of, of, of performance 24 hours a day because the guy watching you is me and I'm never going away. Right? Because you're not performing for them. You're performing for me. Right? Jesus says, by serving that person, you're serving me. Well, that person's not even born again. He didn't say it mattered. How many people were not born again in Jesus' ministry? Everybody! <laughs> Did that selectively change who he served? No. He served them all. Right? 
Now, he, he, show, he, he went first to the Jews, but if a Gentile came to him with faith, he responded to them, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Right? So, now, so to consider others as means to keep, uh, to keep how important others are to God as your leading and first thought in your dealings with them, rather than th thoughts of your equal importance. The word meekness, we're moving on to the word meekness, because that's another one that may not be as well understood. It's an interesting word. I've actually described it to you at least one other time before. First of all, it's not an outward expression. Meekness is not about an outward expression. It's about an inward grace of the soul. It has to do more with why you're doing than what you're doing. Does it have implications for what you're doing? Yes, it does. But the big deal is what's going on, on the inside. Aristotle, who spoke the same Greek language, he describes this exact same word humility as that inward value that stands between two extremes. Like, well, what does that mean? Well, I'll give you an illustration. Jesus said he was meek and mild, right? And yet when he goes into the temple, he weaves together a cord and cords into a whip and drives men out and tumps over their tables in, in what appears to be an outburst of wrath. And, and actually it was by the definition of wrath we've talked about because this wasn't about Jesus. He said it was zeal for his father's house that drove him. It wasn't a personal... He wasn't walking in there self-righteous and saying, well, I'm not like this and you guys are sinners because you are and so I'm going to just destroy everything and prove I'm right and you're wrong. That was not his heart. He was broken. His heart was crushed because they were distorting the image of God's face and turning what was supposed to be a place of intimacy, a house of prayer, of connected with God, connectedness with God, and turned it into a marketplace where they made money, where they made it all about themselves. And it says, so the, it says that the righteous anger of God consumed him, right? But Jesus, if, if someone were to have come against him, we know what he would do. Don't we? How many times did people come against him and he defended himself? He never defended himself. He turned the question back around on them and let them see the futility of their thought. Or when they were going to say, don't you realize that I could take your life from you? Pilate said, he said, you know what? You would have no authority if God hadn't given it to you. And then he laughs back into silence. He didn't defend himself. Jesus never made a whip to drive people away from him. Right? So this was meekness. You're like, well, I just, when I think of the word meekness, I don't see a guy running through a temple with a whip. <laughs> That's why I'm describing the word to you. Because, you know, it, 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 it's, again, Aristotle says it describes, this word describes an inward vi virtue that stands between two extremes. There's this selfish thing and this overwhelming passion on this other end and it's somewhere where it meets in the middle. Okay? You have someone who's meek and mild or, or, or is a mild and gentle person, and yet they've got the zeal for God, and the two come together in the middle. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's meekness, okay? And, and uh, now, uh, so that, that's just a good illustration of it. Now, the next words, which have no, uh, no uh, need for uh, explanation, are long-suffering. We know what that means. Bearing with one another, we get that. Ready, readily forgiving one another, any grievance against one another. He says, being careful to put on love, which is that which makes us stick and stay rather than frustrated and bolt. Okay? He says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That love is the thing that makes you stick and stay rather than get frustrated and bolt. That's what it really means. Stick and stay is the bond of unity. Okay? It keeps you together. Because it keeps you more focused on love of God and his love for them than on how you feel through this whole thing. If you focus on how you feel, you're going to get frustrated and run. And God said, no, 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 no. I want you to put on love because that is the bond that holds you together in unity. You'll stick it out when you don't want to stick it out. Amen? That's part of it. I'm glad that God has this quality. Right? Because he would have bolted from me eons ago. And so it's only natural that he would want that same quality in his offspring, right? Now, what is this world when it says, finally, we are commanded to let the peace which Jesus transferred to us to rule in our hearts because we were invited to this very reality. What does that mean? Rule. Peace, rule. It means to let it govern. 
Let it prevail and abound in our hearts unchallenged. Unchallenged. When it used in, in, the, in the Greek games, the word meant to serve as an umpire or a referee. To rule. Let it make the deciding factor. Let it rule in your heart. I can choose to get all up in anxiety. I can choose to get my feathers ruffled. Or I can choose to live in tranquility and humility. Let it rule. Let it be the umpire. Let it be the referee that decides on the side of peace rules. Right? Okay? That's what it means. Finally, we end with these, these words, which will serve as our springboard to next week. He says, Let the teaching concerning Christ remain as a rich treasure in your hearts. The teaching concerning the person of Christ. In other words, let Christ remain as a rich treasure in your hearts. In all wisdom, teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The wording here essentially is talking more about, it's less about the method and more about the objective. In the early church, I, I, it's, it's ironic that we're bringing it up now because I just mentioned it last Wednesday without even realizing I was going to bring it up this week. I mean, this Sunday, today. But the early church, as I said before, especially because of the busyness of their lives. Um, and, uh, uh, and by busyness, I don't mean busy with things they just wanted to do. They had to do these things to live. So, I mean, when sun was cracking, they were up. And they would get to a place, a house, where other believers were meeting, and they would worship for as long as they could before they had to go to the marketplace and do their work. Or a shepherd go out in the field or whatever it was that they had to do. A uh, wife to the, her, her uh, domestic home management tasks all these things that they had to do that occupied the great majority of their time. But they would meet first, get grounded again in Christ, right? And the way they would do that is by reciting Scripture. And a lot of the ways that they would recite Scripture is they had committed them to rhymes. They were easy to remember. The rhyme was just so it would facilitate memory, right? Or songs, because like we said, that's what brought up the other day, because uh, Stephanie said something about that song's going to be stuck in my head um, that we played. And, and it's not, you know, it, it, how many people had a song stick in your head that you weren't particularly happy, all that wild about the song? But because of the tune, it stuck in your head. Uh, that's why I, I, I do everything I can to avoid listening to, I forget who they are, but the ones who did the Yellow Submarine and all that other stuff. I don't like their music. I just, I hate their music. And every time I hear it, it's stuck in my head and I can't get it out. The Beatles? Um, the Beatles. I, don't, I do not like their music. Um, but, uh, and I, I think their songs are silly, and, and so I know there's going to be a lot of people that hate me for that, but that's the way I see it. And I don't like it, I don't want to hear it, because if I hear it, it's going to be stuck in my head. And I can't get it out, and I already don't like it, so... Don't want it in my head. So, but that, that's why they would do this. They would commit things to music and to, to rhyme and stuff like that because once you heard it, it kind of stick with you because there's a rhythm to it. One, that kind of, one thing kind of flowed right into the next. And so they say, no, encourage one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing with melody and, and so on in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, whatever, whatever you do in word, or an action. Do everything in the name of Jesus. In other words, whatever you do in word or deed it needs to be something that you could slap the name of Jesus on. This was produced by Jesus. Well, that, that, that pretty much it covers everything, doesn't it? Right? He says, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and let it be through him that you give thanks to God the Father. Now, so we're going to close with that. Um, but you can see, the he starts off with saying, if you've raised with Christ, then you need to start acting that way. There's an if, an if statement, an abide, and then a live. Then he starts talking about the things that we ought not do, right? Because we, if you are with Christ, those passions that used to replace God are now gone. We don't live in those passions anymore. God is now my passion. And now that that is true, you must also deal with this list of how it deals with how you live with your brother. Right? Don't do these things. Start doing these things. 
You see the list, right? So it's pretty plain how he laid this whole thing out. And then he says, but the one, the big deals is see to it that love is the big deal. Put on love because that's going to be the bond that makes you stick and stay with your brother when you want to bolt and leave, right? And he said, and then finally, he said, I want you to, um, to, uh, uh, to encourage one another in the Lord and let that peace of God reign as empire, reign as referee in your heart. If, if, if the only way to have peace between your brother is just to accept the wrong, accept the wrong. doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. And I'm telling you, you might nod your head at that, but there are some things that could happen in your life and you think, I can't let go of that. And God says, yes, you can and you better. Period. Period. He didn't say, he said uh, that it's something that I want you to do. He said, this is something that you must do. And you must do it in the same way that I did it for you. How many things that you did were an offense to Christ? He said, there's not anything anybody could do to you in this life that's greater than the offense that we had in sustained against God. And he forgave you willingly, completely, and threw the key away after he set you free. Don't you hold your brother in bondage. Jesus illustrated how silly it is, even with the greatest of offenses that you could sustain as a human being to hold it against somebody else. He said that is comparable to the one man who was forgiven 10 lifetimes of wealth. He could have never paid it back. If he'd had, it would have literally taken every dime of the average. Jesus was very specific in the way he did this. If you looked at the monetary value that he put out there, Jesus knew that on based on the average person's salary of the day, if they gave all of their salary just to this debt, didn't give any money towards living expenses or anything, gave all of their paycheck away, it would take 10 lives to pay it back. He said, that's the debt God forgave you. He said, and then you turn around at the worst offense anybody could ever do against another human. It's like refusing to forgive them a nickel. That's perspective. It's a perspective we really don't have. We can nod and say, I understand that's probably true. But when it comes to actually living it, we don't always really believe it. But he said, I'm telling you, it really is that true. He says, therefore, you must do it. Must. I'm not giving you an option. If you're going to be mine, you must do this. Right? This is so strong that Jesus, in his ministry, said, he said, if you do not forgive your brother their trespasses, I will not forgive you yours. Period. Well, I, I kind of want that forgiveness pretty bad, don't you? Is he hanging that above our head, uh, you know, as a threat? No. He's trying to awaken love inside your heart so that you love as you have been loved. This will set you as free as it sets the person free that you're setting free. That makes sense? I think so. Yeah. Sets you as much free as it does them. Right? You're the one really the most bondage. Most people don't even realize you're walking in unforgiveness with them. They're walking free of it. They don't know and they don't care. You're the one in bondage. Let it go. But don't let it go because you're in bondage. Let it go because you're honoring God. Amen? Anybody have any thoughts before we close out? Mark? Yes. Just real quick, I won't go into a lot of detail because it, again, you can preach sermon after sermon after sermon on this. But what came to my mind right there in relation to uh, verse 12 mm -hmm. was the example, the parable that Jesus gave in regards to who is your neighbor and then with the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, when he says this, chosen was holy and love. A priest walks past the robber that has been beaten up. Yeah. yeah. For what reasons we know necessarily, you know, it doesn't go into detail. We can do a lot of supposition and that type of thing. A Levite, so and so forth, and yeah, the Samaritan exhibited those virtues mm -hmm. whenever he, he attended to the ones who had been beaten and robbed. I mean, the compassion, the kindness, humility, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, just something I wanted to submit. No, it's very good. Uh, that, that whole parable of the, the Samaritan was lived out in Paul with uh, Onesimus, who was a slave who yes. became a born-again Christian and attached himself to Paul. And Paul knew his owner, who was um, Philemon. 
And uh, who, by the way, was a Christian. You mean Christians had slaves? Yes. Scriptures aren't against that. And uh, and so, but he told uh, he told um, uh, told him. He said, you know what? Um, your brother is very valuable to me in the ministry. And he said, if there's any loss that you have sustained by him leaving, I'll pay it. He said, but if you want him back, I'll send him back. But I'm asking you, as a brother, let him stay with me. Give him his freedom. And I believe that in the end, finally, it did. But the, nonetheless, the bottom line was that uh, uh, that same notion of, because remember, the, 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 the guy that was on the side of the road, not only did he put him up in, in a hotel, but then he got, told the, the hotel owner, he said, when I come back by next week, if, you know, if there's any remaining debt, I'll pay off the rest of it. I don't know how long he's going to stay here, but whatever it is, I'll pay it. And that's what Paul was like. You know, he said, you know, if, if, if whatever you have sustained is a loss because of him leaving, it's my debt, I'll pay it. 